And so I thought I would um, start out just by inviting uh, our panelists to maybe reflect on some of your own most gratifying uh, successes in your efforts to, to apply information from the condition uh, of resources to on-the-ground management. I guess I might ask you, Carl, to, um, to take that one first, since it seems like you've um, been most directly involved in on-the-ground projects. Sure. I would say the, the greatest success that I've seen uh, in improving water quality through sound forestry practices, is, I touched upon it briefly, and that is implementing acceptable management practices. When we've been harvesting timber for, for eons, essentially, and uh, to maintain water quality, it's important that we we take care of our forestry and preventing pollution limits from occurring. Uh, the Clean Water Act, which was established a long time ago, um, established uh, regulations regarding how much pollution a water body can take and how much permitting is involved. And forestry has a Clean Water Act exemption. So a logger does not have to file for permits through a variety of regulatory sources to conduct uh, timber harvest for uh, water pollution control, as long as uh, AMPs are in place. And I've seen great success in logger education, teaching loggers sound management techniques from designing the timber sale to carrying it out to closing it up. Um, and minimizing that transfer of sediment from the, the land into the surrounding water bodies. It's been, it's been a great success. We monitor it, as I said, regularly. And 80 to 90 percent of the time, we don't see any problems. So that's been a great success. Uh, I hope we can continue it. Uh, we can't see every piece of land all the time. And, uh, but we're doing a snapshot, and those snapshots are looking really good. So I hope we can continue that. And Tony Lynn, have you seen any um, uh, models worth replicating in your own uh, experience with uh, managing invasive species? Yeah, um, I'm actually going to answer your first question. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, because something that we've been thinking a lot about in the climate science centers and in, um, in climate science in general is is using like a translational ecology approach, Dan mentioned, or a knowledge co-production approach. So from the very beginning, um, even like before a grant proposal is written, um, partnering between scientists and managers to figure out what really needs to be known and how we can get there. And that um, really with a decision focus, so where would that information get you in terms of improving your decisions that you need to make eventually? And I think in the context of monitoring, that's really powerful because um, the, cl the funded climate is so harsh for um, long-term monitoring projects and um, doing the research that relates to that monitoring can be such a challenge to get funded. And so if we, we can really be sitting down scientists and managers and saying, what do we need to know in order to better manage and adaptively manage um, our forests, then we're going to be able to really focus those dollars and those resources in as efficiently as possible. And I think that's something sort of new from the science end. The Forest Service R&D has always had that mandate, and to some degree USGS, but um, we see really um, academics and federal scientists coming to the table on this. And so those of you that are scientists in state agencies already do this, but really trying to get these teams together to co-produce knowledge, as we say, right from the beginning. And so that's what we're trying to do with this invasive species um, model is to say, what could we monitor for? And then when we learn about the monitoring, like how can that inform research? And then how can the research inform the monitoring and back and forth right from the beginning instead of just, okay, we published our paper, here it is, hope it's useful. Colin, have you either participated in or, or seen some of these sort of motivating uh, successes that, that keep you at this yeah. work? Yeah, I think I mentioned a few things briefly. One of the things that's been really rewarding is to see working with regulators in New York State and trying to come up with critical moves for the state. Um, and so they're, they're, the encouragement of a number of folks and their ability to embrace more holistic approaches with not only chemical indicators, but biological indicators, economic and cultural indicators of, of damages or changes due to pollution, and incorporating that into critical words 
process and, and just the determination to put up the roads. I think it's exciting. They're not all the way there yet, but they're, 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 they're on that really good path. Um, another example has been involved a lot with um, developing a climate science greenhouse in New York State. Um, and in fact, our, we're doing this with Cornell and NESCOM and a number of other groups. Um, and creating a, a kind of one stop spot for New York State climate science and data and adaptation strategies. Um, what's been really powerful about that is how open data has become. And the democratization of data and the transparency of data and the ability for us to build things like web maps, which draw sources from all over the place and allow the data creators to maintain and update and modify their own sources and that's really very efficiently to bring them in via the cloud. They're just web services, but you know what you want to say. And so it's exciting to be able to do that. More and more agencies um, are moving to open data models and hopefully a big hope, but hopefully that will change. Um, the last thing I'll mention is actually relative to, to what um, uh, Jim originally invited me for, is we've been doing a lot of participatory work in the Adirondacks um, in terms of recreation planning. And some of you may know that, that any type of planning in the Adirondack Park can be very controversial. We're in the midst of a very ugly debate right now about classifying some land. Um, as wilderness or bioforest. Um, but we had a very constructive process in engaging a lot of different stakeholders in, in, in a participatory process where we generated knowledge together. They, that co knowledge, that, that co generation of knowledge went into planning at a very early stage. And while our work has been somewhat blanketed by the negative news stories and all the conflict, there's still a lot of promise for those kinds of approaches for engaging people in decision making. Okay, so you, you, both Tony Lynn and Colin talked about cooperative efforts, and, and uh, Colin, you mentioned open data models as ways to add efficiencies to your programs and hopefully maximize um, their impact. And as uh, there's some uncertainty about the status of you know, resources to, to fund our operations, um, I wonder if uh, how else you are thinking about adding um, efficiencies to design of, of your programs and maintaining those core elements that um, need to be sustained uh, to ensure their long-term value? Okay. Well, I to I Ways, ways of, that, um, that the, of the state and private forestry program might be looking to um, to protect its, its core uh, interests um, by adding efficiencies to its, to its operations. Sure. Um, the easiest way to answer that is looking around the room. It's through collaboration, through partnerships. The uh, the Forest Service is obviously a, a huge organization that uh, manages forest resources nationwide and, and international programs, but we can't, we can't do it alone. So it's through collaborations and partnerships, uh, in some cases at a landscape scale, that we're able to um, bring resources together, state, private, uh, nonprofit, corporate, etc., to, uh, to help to help uh, solve some of these problems. Also working with, uh, you know, municipalities. And one statistic I wanted to throw out there related to uh, watershed management and drinking water, and that is the cost of managing a forest versus the cost of, of treating water. If you have a sound forest management program, there's one dollar figure. If you don't treat your forest properly and you just treat water with a water treatment plant, it's going to be very expensive. And then studies show, and some folks debate this, that for every dollar spent on forest management, you save upwards of $27 in water treatment costs. So without having to build a filtration plant or a treatment plant by having sound forest management. So it's working together with the timber industry, the water supply industry, and the regulatory community to make sure that gets done. It's, it's, a, it's a big partnership, and that's the only way it's going to work effectively. A lot of nodding heads. Glad to take any questions for the panel from, from the group. Yes.
What's your name and your your title? No, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know if everyone heard Vicky, but um, I think, I mean, I'm just going to repeat it as if I said something as wise as you just, as she just said. So, <laughs> I mean, I think, um, so she was just asking and making a great point that, it's important to be focusing on um, early detection and prevention and that um, the message really can't be that uh, we'll just take care of it once it gets here. Um, I think that anybody who works in this area um, knows that and feels really daunted by it. Um, I, I work on um, climate change refugia a lot, actually, um, and... Uh, to me, it's, it's sort of similar um, goal or strategy in the sense that um, so climate change refugia or a potential adaptation uh, strategy, a resistance strategy that we might um, identify areas that we really care about and then do everything we can to keep them um, sort of protected in every other way because they also seem to be buffered from climate change. And um, you could think about maybe invasive species management, and probably most of you that work on this do already, as these um, sort of triage approach, a, a, a triage approach or um, a resistance strategy, in that you're never going to be able to, you know, we're not going to keep southern pine beetle out of all of Massachusetts forever at this point. Um, you can't. Uh, it's really hard to deal with these um, issues, and so you end up picking and choosing. Like in all management, you get to touch so little of the land. You know, I used to work for Forest Service, and you get so little opportunity with the resources you have and the time you have in the year to touch um, and manage. So, and certainly, um, that's the case for invasive species as well. Um, that said, you're going to have that much more um, effectiveness and impact on the early end of things, and that's where, again, like it's so powerful to be monitoring so you can get things early and um, you're probably going to end up focusing on the areas that really matter culturally or in terms of endangered species or um, in some other way are just prioritized and those are the places that you're really going to fight invasive in early and later on um, and, and going to have to be in sort of a triage approach. I wish that there was like a more positive message, but I was I always thought, man, I think that um, invasive species work must be like some of the most depressing um, work to do, and then we decided to work on invasive species and climate change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have, have you seen examples of a scheme uh, through which people can assess those priorities, um, some kind of uh, a key uh, to? to evaluate the trade-offs between prevention and control? Um, specifically with invasive species management. Does anyone in the audience have an idea of that? <laughs> Do you have, like, your favorite? Yeah. Sure. I think there's one I can... Um, thanks for your presentation, first of all, and I just want to salute the brilliant work being done in Mass and New York. Um, I go there as often as I can because it's great examples of collaboration, partnership, good, good people energy. Um, to touch on Vicky's question on invasive species, how do you demonstrate, how do you sell the message of prevention versus you know, coming in after the fact? First of all, there, there's not, we don't have enough presence on the land. We, we can't, it's the big obstacle that I see all the time, and I'm private, I'm a sole proprietor managing invasive species. 
Um, liability and insurance coverage is my biggest obstacle. Um, regardless of how much money I make in a year, I still have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars just just for the risk that something might happen. I deal with giant hogweed. I mean, yes, something could happen to me, but my barn could fall over when I go home, or I could trip over my steps, and that's that. So the, one of the biggest hindrances I see, literally, is is risk and how to deal with basic liability. Um, I pull 70 plus thousand wild parsnip every year, and I do not get hurt, but I can't afford to get hurt, so I'm driven by that. Um, so I, w- I would love to just plant that seed that we need to address, I mean, Vermont in particular, why is workman's compensation $5,000 a year? That's necessary, but how do you overcome that? So I was preaching a little bit there. But to Vicky's question, I just finished eight days of um, glossy buckthorn pulling in Norwich. So that's Connecticut River watershed. And I'm able, because I document what I do, I'm able to tell the landowner, I just pulled 12,600 glossy buckthorn off of your four acres. Okay, I mean, that's, that's to be expected. It's got a pretty dense infestation. But, hey, by the way, I also found, because you have them by your house, a single euonymus burning bush tree shrub out in the middle of the forest, out in the middle of nowhere. A couple of multi-flora rows, too. And I went ahead and sat down under the tree, took a break, got out the water bottle, and pulled every little seedling that I could find underneath that tree. And you may not think burning bush, people tell me all the time, it doesn't go anywhere, it just stays here, Mike. It's, it's surrounded by lawn, that's a dead zone, that's a monoculture, it behaves. When I told that landowner, well, yeah, but you had 439 seedlings in the shadow, in the immediate shadow of this one tree out in the middle of the forest, that that's enables him and, him and others to understand, oh, wow, maybe 439 plants is a big deal, and I shouldn't, you know, kind of keep these on my landscape in the first place. I'll give one more shout-out to private companies. I hope you can engage um, in the world of partnerships, um, good partners like King Arthur Flower and many of the land trusts that we have in Vermont, um, doing managing their lands because it's what they believe in. It's it's their certified B corporations, or they have a mission, and they're not looking for grants or money. They're just you know putting the money in their mouth as this is what they stand for and what they want with it. Those are my thoughts. Perfect. Thanks, thanks for your thoughts. Sounds like if you haven't already signed up for Tony's Risk uh, List, sir, uh, it be good to have your perspective in, in future conversations because it sounds like the experiences of practitioners can help inform um, ways to overcome some of these obstacles that, that you've seen. I think there was a question earlier up front here. No? Okay. Anyone else have uh, any observations or questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, so I, too, am an uh, invasive plant uh, consultant, contractor. Apparently, we spend too much time in the woods pulling invasives, and we get in front of people and just want to talk. But anyhow, question, is there a way of tying in all three elements? You have, uh, you know, you have uh, forested buffers, you have invasive species, and you have ecosystem services. Can we sort of, and we know that there's climate change, can we equate, you know, the effects of climate change with some of these other, um, you know, shortcomings in across our landscape? So, for example, can we say, yeah, we know the climate's going to warm two degrees, but if we restore the buffers, if we plant the buffers and get rid of the invasives, we can gain an equivalent three degrees in uh, benefit. And I'm just wondering, that may be a way of presenting it to the public and, um, you know, that, you know, people can connect the dots, so to speak. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we often think about that in terms of cold adapted fish, where, you know, you let some tree canopy back over a river and you get, or a stream, and you get a couple degrees cooler, and that can be complicating for a couple degrees. To think of it in invasive species, um, terms, I've certainly never heard anyone put it this way, but yeah, if we think we're going to get X percentage more of um, a, a plant moving north or being able to establish better or den- um, more densely um, grow in because of warmer temperatures or increased CO2, that could translate into percentage more of work 
for people to be pulling them or um, otherwise managing them um, that could actually offset that climate change effect, which is really interesting. Yeah, I think it's, I, I really like the idea of integrating all of these things. Um, I guess I think about it more from the standpoint, um, I don't know if we can offset the change, but adapt to the change. And to think about, we certainly need to incentivize landowners and others to create effective buffers in our current areas. And one of the ways to do that is to quantify the benefits of those and, and, and incorporate those into programs. You know, uh, to compensate for the opportunity cost of, of creating those buffers. Um, but well, we, are, we want to create buffers that are going to be effective and resilient in the changing climate, and particularly if we have more intense storm events and so forth. And certainly we don't want to create buffers full of invasives. Um, although, it may be controversial to say this, we will be in this room. Maybe they can provide some benefits to us as well as some detriments. Um, I'm reminded of, a, of a, um, a, a study that was done by my, my colleague over at Syracuse University, Charlie Driscoll, um, uh, uh, looking at zebra mussels um, who actually seem to remove a lot more mercury out of the water than the native bivalves. Um, and we hate zebra mussels, right? But maybe, just maybe, they're providing some kind of benefit for us. Um, and we may need to rethink our unadulterated distaste for some of these invasives. And of course, there's these Eat the Invasives programs all over the place. Kudzu, in fact, is delicious. Um, uh, <laughs> if you're willing to learn how to cook with it. Um, but, but I think getting, getting to some of these issues, I think we, we may need to be a little bit more flexible in our thinking so that we can create um, ad adaptive uh, solutions for rapidly changing the future, which sounds like a corporate logo. But, um, I, yeah, I don't know how else to put it. So. Um, one way that I've seen us integrate the issues related to your question, and I think we need to do a lot more of it, um, and it's to demonstrate how these things work. And in, in several states, we've developed model forests which show people how to manage invasives, how to install buffers, how to put in a water bar, how to build a, an effective stream crossing. And it's through these model forests that uh, both landowners and students and anyone can, can come and see, gee, I can do this, this is it's not that difficult, and um, look how successful it is. You can have a, a before treatment and an after treatment parcel on this particular forest and, and demonstrate whether it's a timber stand removal or an invasive species treatment or, or a deer browse issue. I've seen all of these work very effectively uh, in a model forest or an experimental forest situation. And getting that data and that, those images out to people and out to the media are, are critically important for us to reach our goals because uh, all of us here are enlightened. Uh, scientists and practitioners, but there's a hundred times more people that have the faintest idea what we're doing. So by demonstrating it uh, on the ground with a sound uh, forest management program and a model forest is, is, is critical. I want to see much, much more of that done to uh, you know, blow the horn for ourselves. Perfect. Well, I, I want to thank you all for sharing your experiences and perspectives and, and uh, also introducing a controversial uh, topic for discussion uh, during, during the coffee hour. Great way to, to spur uh, continuing dialogue as, as the day progresses. So could you all please uh, join me in thanking our panel.